All right, well, thank you all for, uh, for coming so early. Um, it looks like a very exciting day of talks ahead of us, and I'm very glad to get mine over first thing. Um, the project I'm going to be telling you about today was uh, spearheaded by a very talented graduate student in my lab, Amalia Hajitheodoru, along with a group of uh, wonderful collaborators um, whose contributions I'll describe as I go along. The, the sort of central question that we're trying to understand is how cells make decisions. And I know many of you are interested in the concept of how cells make decisions in the context of differentiation, but also on a much shorter time scale, uh, many cells have to make sort of immediate decisions. Uh, for example, if we look at this movie here, this is a, a human neutrophil or neutrophil-like cell line, um, which is crawling around in tissue culture uh, where it's been co-cultured with some GFP-expressing bacteria. This is the pathogen Staphylococcus aureus. As this um, cell crawls around, you can see it's doing its job of um, phagocytosing or, or eating uh, the bacteria that are in, in its environment. And it has to make decisions about when to move and when to eat and um, how to uh, move directionally in order to get to the point that it can um, take up these, these phagocytes, or sorry, these, these pathogens. So, um, so we're really interested in understanding decision making at this sort of level of how cells um, decide which end is the front and which end is the back, and as they're navigating through complex environments, um, how they decide which way to go. So for neutrophils and for many other motile cells, the machinery that powers the movement is uh, largely the actin network at the front of the cell, um, which extends out this uh, broad lamellipodium and pushes the cell into new environments. Um, and as you can see here, uh, the assembly of these uh, brightly fluorescent actin filaments is really coincident with the extension of the cell leading edge. And I wanna show you this movie in real time. This was collected with high-speed imaging of 50 millisecond frames um, so that you can appreciate uh, really the, the incredibly rapid dynamics that are associated with this kind of cell motility. You can see not only the extension of the actin at the leading edge, but also a lot of internal fluid flows um, that are also contributing to overall movement of the cell. Um, and here you can see the actin right at the front. But at the same time that there's all this excitement going on at the front, uh, there's also interesting things going on at the back. And in particular, you can see the, the rear of the cell is able to reorient when the cell makes a turn um, so that it always ends up basically having the front and the rear um, opposite one another. This is something that's been uh, fairly well characterized at the molecular level, uh, and there's been a lot of work characterizing what the machineries are that operate at the front of the cell and the rear of the cell, um, which are summarized here in this very nice review from Ann Ridley. Um, unfortunately, I'm not sure you can uh, read the writing, but the basic idea is that there's a whole set of things that contribute to actin polymerization at the front. And then the rear uh, is where myosin-2 is largely concentrated. That's the same contractile protein uh, that's in muscle. It's just a different isoform of that contractile protein that gathers at the rear and sort of squeezes the rear of the cell in order to help move everything forward, like squeezing the back of the tube of toothpaste. And it's generally accepted in the field that the reason that you have one front and one rear for a cell like a neutrophil is because there's mutual antagonism between the signaling proteins um, that determine activity at the front, largely driven by actin polymerization, and activity at the rear, largely driven by contractility. And the fact that these um, signaling pathways and also the, the actual organization of the, the cytoskeleton in those two locations are mutually antagonistic is what enables the stability in the situation for there to be one front and one rear. So that's great, that all makes sense. But of course for cells, uh, you know, sometimes they run into a little bit of difficulty and have to make more complex decisions. And that's illustrated here um, in this movie taken by Mugda Seta, who's a postdoc in the lab, of a GFP labeled neutrophil in the tail fin of a zebrafish. So this is just the very end of the, the spinal cord in the developing embryo. And here she's induced a wound with a laser. And you can see these um, GFP expressing neutrophils are moving rapidly towards the wound to try to help clear things up. And this little guy up here is crawling through the extracellular matrix and there's a point you can see where it ends up actually splitting its leading edge into three leading edges, presumably because it's run into some obstacles in its way. And then it has to choose which one to maintain and which ones to abandon. So in this particular case, the cell chooses the one in the middle and then uh, retracts the other two. So this is uh, specifically the focus of Amalia's work is trying to understand how a cell selects which front to maintain and which one to abandon when it's in this sort of uh, situation where it's been forced to make multiple leading edges. So rather than relying on this happening in uh, living tissues, which are very complex and of course not that reproducible from one animal to another, um, Amalia uh, worked together with uh, Felix Alette in Daniel Aremia's lab at the Massachusetts General Hospital to design a microfluidic device where she could force this form of splitting of the leading edge to happen in an extremely well-defined uh, geometrical way uh, and happen reproducibly. 
So uh, the cells um, start off at one end and then they're attracted using a chemoattractant and a well at the opposite end of the device to run down these microfluidic channels. And then inside the microfluidic channels, there are symmetrical barriers that are set up at intervals. And you can see that here. So it's a, sort of an oval barrier. And the cell, as you can see, just barely fits in the channel. So when it runs into the barrier, something's gonna have to happen. And what most typically happens is what you see here, um, and here we've labeled the actin at the front of the cell and the myosin at the back of the cell, so you can see their dynamics. So you can see the cell initially splits its leading edge in two, but then one of the two leading edges ends up winning and the other one retracts. And when that uh, losing leading edge retracts, I hope you can see uh, the myosin accumulates right there and helps to pull that leading edge in. So in order for the cell to resolve this dilemma that it finds itself in, it has to somehow respecify what used to be a front into a back, despite the fact that, as I described, the, the structural organization of those two ends of the cell is very different, and there's also signaling pathways that are mutually antagonistic that stop you from being a front and a back simultaneously. But now that Amalia was able to do this in this very reproducible way, we can now take a quantitative approach to trying to dissect how the cell actually goes about this decision-making process where it has to choose one of the two leading edges to maintain and then convert one of those fronts into a rear. So uh, for the vast majority of events, uh, as I said, it looks something like this. First, the, the cell runs into the obstacle, and then there's splitting of the leading edge in a way that looks very symmetric, where both of the new fronts are trying to advance. And then there's an initiation of retraction, where one of the fronts wins, one of them loses, and the one that loses eventually gets converted into a rear. So um, to, to try to uh, get a little bit more of a handle about what the order of events are here, Amalia started off by just measuring how the cytoskeletal organization changes um, in those two fronts as they go through this decision-making process. And given that it's the actin polymerization that's actually driving the, the front of the cell forward, we expected up front that the, um, the, the choice between the two leading edges would basically come down to which leading edge was stronger. And based on what we know about the mechanics of that process, we expected that that would be reflected in there being a higher density of actin filaments in one of the two edges than the other, and that would be the one that ended up winning. So this just shows you a single example, um, but Amalia has done this many times, of tracking here the, the winner in blue and the loser in red. Uh, and this is just taking um, various different size uh, sort of swaths across the leading edge in case um, there was uh, some variation in terms of uh, how the actin was structured as we move backwards. But if we look here at this um, largest, uh, largest swath, which is a, about uh, two and a half microns back from the leading edge, what you see is that the actin intensity in both the winner and the loser is very, very comparable from the time that the, the cell hits the post until right before the large retraction starts. It's only in that last you know, sort of 10 seconds or so that you can begin to see any difference in terms of the amount of actin at the leading edge. So it seems like it wasn't really pre ordained that the cell was going to go one way or the other, but rather both leading edges are perfectly competent, um, and then at some point very late in this competition process, one of the edges wins and one of them loses. So in order to try to take a, a slightly more uh, unbiased objective approach to understanding what the structural changes are associated with this decision-making process, rather than focus solely on actin, the leading edge, Amalia decided to take a step back and really look at all of the cytoskeletal elements all, all throughout the cell to see if there were other sorts of asymmetries that might be showing up earlier in this process that would end up dictating that the cell had to go one way versus the other. So in order to do this, she um, started off with a large collection of raw images of cells in this decision-making process um, on the order of about 100 movies like the ones that I showed you. And then for all the raw images, she went through some pre-processing um, so that they could all have intensities comparable to one another and she could really take a quantitative approach across this whole large data set. And then she used a cell profiler to extract image features. And uh, this includes things like the cell shape, the intensity of the uh, fluorescently labeled proteins, um, but also things like their distribution, their texture, their granularity, basically anything that, be, can, that can be calculated from the image itself. And in the end, there's over 700 features um, that describe the cell shape and the distribution of these two proteins that come out of this analysis package. Um, so then we had to figure out how to really be able to compare one movie to another. And this was a little complicated because um, after the, the cell hits the post uh, and extends two leading edges, they take varying amounts of time to actually make this decision. So some of them are able to decide quite quickly within about 20 seconds after they hit the post. Some of them wait for a minute or even two minutes before they really decide. And we wanted to be able to average across this whole population even though the, the time that it takes each individual cell to decide um, was uh, variable. So um, 
she came up with two different methods to do this analysis. One is to rescale time, uh, so to take the, the time that the cell hits the obstacle as being the beginning of the event, the time that the cell clearly decides and uh, one of the leading edges retracts of being the end, and then split it up into a fixed number of intervals or interpolating um, the time. The other approach that she could take was to say, well, the, what we're really interested in is this decision-making process at the end, so we can line them all up at the end and then just truncate um, the, the earlier parts of the movie. In the end, both methods really gave very similar results, so I'm going to focus on this um, interpolation rescaling kind of analysis. So after uh, doing all that image extraction and then post-processing, what we ended up with, of course, was a, an insanely large data set of you know, 100 movies, 700 features, um, and all of these time points leading up the decision-making process. So we had to have some way of actually selecting which were the features that gave the best uh, prediction in terms of what the cell was going to end up doing. And in order to do this, we actually really benefited from the fact that uh, Rob Tibshirani, who's a statistician at uh, Stanford University, is on Amalia's thesis committee, and uh, very kindly agreed to help uh, with uh, uh, regularization uh, using a method he developed called the lasso um, that enables you to take these 700 features and then narrow them down to the 20 that are actually most informative. So after doing that, uh, we then came up with a model that's going to predict from any of these images anywhere in the time sequence whether the cell is likely to turn to the left or turn to the right. And uh, this shows the result of that model. This is the best model um, that we were able to come up with from all of these image features. Uh, and what we're looking at here, zero is the time when the, one of the two leading edges really attracts. Um, and then this uh, minus 14 is the, the earliest interpolated time point that basically is when the cell runs into the obstacle. And the black line here shows the cross-validation of the training set. The green line is a test set that was held out of the model building. And what you can see is, you know, we start off at the beginning, it's really 50-50. It is not preordained which way the cell is going to go. Uh, and the likelihood uh, or our ability to predict whether the cell is going to go right or left stays really low throughout really most of this process. And it's only, you know, sort of in this last um, few interpolated time points, which corresponds to about 15 seconds, that even measuring everything we can possibly measure about the cell, that we can tell uh, which way it's going to go to the right or the left with greater than 70% accuracy. So maybe we're not looking at the right thing. Maybe the actin and the, micro and the myosin aren't actually the thing that's determining which way the cell is going, even though they're the engines um, that are driving the behavior of the front and the back. There has been some suggestions in the literature that uh, determining decision making, at least for some cells in the immune system, like for dendritic cells, is actually um, driven by microtubules instead, or by positioning the nucleus instead. So. Um, so besides starting off with this actin myosin cell shape model, which as I told you can go back about five interpolated time points equivalent to about 15 seconds, looking at the actin alone or the myosin alone um, actually are less predictive. We can only predict with the actin about nine seconds in advance, with the myosin only about three seconds in advance. Um, and cell shape alone likewise um, can only go back a little bit in time. But Amalia collected this other data set, an independent data set, where the nucleus and the microtubules were labeled. And there, um, it actually doesn't do any better. Uh, and in fact, the nucleus uh, alone uh, predicts no better than the cell shape alone. The microtubules basically don't have any predictive value at all in the cell type. So this was a little frustrating. We were hoping to sort of come up with a key about you know, what is the part of the cell that actually makes the decision. But it seems like all of these things are happening just very, very late. And it seems like there are probably consequences of the decision rather than causes. Uh, so, as I said, Rob Tibshirani was on Amalia's thesis committee, and uh, he and his collaborators have worked out a whole lot of different methods for mining to find uh, important components in these very large-scale data sets. And Amalia basically tried everything that they've ever worked out. And for the aficionados, this is just a list of the things that, that she tried. And the bottom line is it doesn't get any better than that. We can only predict the decision a few seconds in advance, um, suggesting that it, it may just be stochastic. There may not be any sort of predetermination. But remember, everything that we've been looking at here has been at the level of the cytoskeleton, at the level of the actual mechanical elements in the cell that determine its movement. And um, of course, there's also signaling um, that's going on here uh, that may be happening earlier. And um, all my career, I've tried to avoid studying signaling. And the reason is because of things like this. Um, it's insanely complicated. This is meant to be a, a simplified diagram of the signaling pathways that are active at the, the leading edge of a cell, including things like chemotactic uh, receptors that, that go through G-protein couple receptors and uh, signal to these small GTPases that eventually end up um, driving actin polymerization to the leading edge. 
Um, now, obviously, we couldn't look at all of these things. Uh, fortunately, there have been some very nice work done by uh, Hiwan Yang and uh, Sean Collins when they were postdocs in Tobias Meyer's lab at Stanford that examined some of the key uh, GTPases that are involved in the single transduction leading edge of the cell. And they were able to identify that of the, the sort of major um, candidates for small GTPases that might drive um, turning at the leading edge of neutrophils, the only one that actually predicted turning before it happened uh, was CDC42. So uh, we could feel like we could safely ignore rack, RAS, and row, and focus instead on what's happening with the CDC42 at the leading edge. So uh, Sean Collins uh, kindly provided us with a, a FRET reporter, a, a fluorescence resonance energy transfer reporter, so that we could look at the level of CDC42 activity at the leading edge as cells go through this process. And here the yellow indicates that's a high level of CDC42 activity. The blue indicates a low level of CDC42 activity. And this polarization where the cell is heading upwards and we see most of the CDC42 at the front is exactly what we expect um, based on, on prior work in these cells. So now we can watch the cell as it goes through the decision-making process. Process, and you can see as it splits, both sides have CDC42. And then one of them is going to win, and that's the one that maintains the CDC42 at the leading edge. So that's comforting. That's basically sort of a positive control, indicating that the, the probe is working the way that we expect it to. But we can learn a lot of information now about looking at this time course. So this shows the ratio between the CDC42 at the winning leading edge and the CDC42 at the losing leading edge. And you can see, just like I showed you with the cytoskeleton, they start off really being exactly the same as each other, where the ratio between those two things is close to one. And it's not until, again, late in the time course that we really see the asymmetry begin to develop, where there's a clear winner and a clear loser, where the winner has a higher level of activity. Now, this goes back a little bit further than the cytoskeletal predictions, but it's still only on the order of about 15 to 20 seconds uh, before the decision is made. So it seems like probably there's some sort of feedback loops um, where the winner uh, eventually becomes convinced that it should be the one to maintain the CDC42, and the, the loser loses its CDC42 signal. So that was what we had initially thought, just looking at the ratio between the winner and the loser. Uh, but of course, we can also look separately at the winning side and the losing side and see what goes on with them dynamically over time. And this, this frankly, came as a little bit of a surprise. Um, my expectation was we start off with high CDC42 in both edges. As the cell goes through this competition phase, um, the CDC42 is maintained um, in one and is lost in the other. But what we actually saw when we look quantitatively at the CDC42 activity is that you know, as the cell goes to, into this competition phase where it's sort of stuck on the pillar and it can't physically move forward because it's, it's got um, both of its leading edges competing with each other, uh, the intensity of CDC42 signal drops in the losing side. And you can see that here nicely in the quantitation. Um, it goes down over time in the losing side. But it also goes down over time in the winning side. And so what's happening here is not really that one of them is losing it and one of them is keeping it, but rather they're both losing it over time. It's just the winner is losing a little bit more slowly. So, um, whoops. so, uh, so we can re reframe this concept as saying you know, the winner is, the, is just the loser who loses more slowly. But we see that both fronts are actually experiencing doubt, if you will, that CDC42 is the reporter of commitment to being a leading edge and triggering the positive feedback loops that give you continuous actin polymerization. If the cell is physically prevented from moving forward, in this case because it's getting stuck um, on, this, on this obstacle, then uh, that, those positive feedback loops are, are somehow being discouraged from uh, continuing. And the, the, those leading edges seem to be doubting um, whether or not that's really, that's really a good decision to keep moving in that direction. So um, at this point, then, it seemed like, you know, at first, both of the leading edges are fully convinced that, they are, that you know, each one is the right leading edge, is the, you know, the true and only leading edge. And then at some point in this competition, both of them begin to doubt. And so we wondered if it might be possible to bias the choice that the cell is making by encouraging one of the two leading edges um, by activating its CDC42. And so here again, we're very fortunate to collaborate with Sean and his graduate student, George Bell, shown here, who had developed this wonderful method of taking an opsin, which is a G protein couple receptor that's light sensitive. You know, for example, we have opsins in the retinas of our eyes. And um, putting that in neutrophils so that he could use a laser light to activate the opsin at one particular point on the cell. And you can see wherever the laser light is activated, that's the direction the actin polymerizes, and therefore that's the direction that the cell moves. So uh, Amalia went down to Davis to do these experiments together with George and Sean and was able to um, then use this tool in our microfluidic channels. And so the first thing she did, again, you know, sort of a control, is um, to take a cell that's just moving in a straight channel that's not experiencing the obstacles and seeing if she can convince the rear to become a front 
by activating CDC42 at the rear, okay? So this is what it looks like, cells crawling along, high CDC42 at the front. There's the laser stimulation. You can see it turns around and goes backwards. And as I emphasized at the beginning, polarity in neutrophils is extremely stable. So if the intervention didn't happen, there would basically be no events that you would ever see where the cell stopped in the middle and went backwards. But here she could persuade it to do that about 30% of the time by activating um, this opsin. And you can see that uh, the CDC42 does indeed end up shifting over to what used to be the rear. Interestingly, that process takes a really long time. So uh, although uh, she can start seeing the CDC42 rise at the back of the cell within a single frame, which is three seconds after initially shining that laser light, the front of the cell, that's five minutes? Okay, thank you. The front of the cell um, is still, uh, still has high CDC42 and in fact has higher CDC42 than what's gonna be the rear for about 40 seconds, even though the cell turns around and starts heading the other direction after about 18 seconds. So there's interesting timing here and it turns out it's not the case that just the thing with the higher CDC42 is automatically the front. Um, the, the end that has lower CDC42 can become the front and can actually drive the movement um, even if there's a competing front at the other end that wants to maintain itself. So, um, so this is pretty intriguing, but of course, what we really want to do is get back to the, uh, the decision-making process and see if we can bias that decision using this wonderful optogenetic tool. So the obvious experiment to try is let the cells run into the pillars, then choose one of the two leading edges and shine the laser on it to see if we can then drive it um, to go in that direction. So this is going to show that experiment. And again, when the little uh, purple circle comes on, that's when the, when the cell is being stimulated. So here it goes. It splits. We choose that one and keep trying, keep trying, keep trying, and then eventually it does get biased. And um, you can see the, the, uh, the uh, increase in the turning towards the direction um, that we have the laser light on is modest, but it does exist and it's highly significant. Um, instead of having 50% of the cells go each way, we can get 75% of the cells to go um, the way that we want them to with this optogenetic tool. Okay, so one thing you may have noticed watching this movie and that was kind of a surprise to Amalia and George when they first started doing these experiments was that you really have to keep insistently activating the CDC42 in one of those two sides before you can really begin to see a bias in this process. So we wondered if there might be some, you know, some sort of window of time where the cell was receptive to that stimulation um, that didn't cover the entire, um, the entire uh, time of the movie. Um, so she also tried a set of experiments of just um, biasing right at the very beginning of just hitting it a few times um, and then letting the cell go. And that ends up not making any difference at all. So enhancing CDC42, even though there's all these positive feedback loops, is not sufficient to actually drive um, that decision making if it's applied early. It has to be throughout the process or um, uh, even later. So what's happening uh, here with these experiments um, is that, uh, again, remember I told you that in unstimulated cells, both the losing side and the winning side actually have decreasing CDC42. The winning side just loses a little bit more slowly. With optogenetic stimulation, the solid lines here show what happens. The losing side, um, does, it doesn't make any difference. But the winning side still loses CDC42. It just loses it a little bit yet more slowly. So the, the confidence that we're instilling in the decision making in reinforcing the winner is um, just slightly modifying uh, the rate of loss of CDC42 at the leading edge rather than a direct enhancement. Now, as I said, we could only get about 75% of the cells to go the way we wanted them to instead of 100%. So Amalia stratified, whoops, stratified the, the cells that um, turn to the left, and this includes ones who wanted to turn to the left and ones who uh, listened to the signal to turn to the left versus cells that turned to the right. In other words, they were stimulated but did not, but ignored the signal. And what she saw was that the ones that ignored the signal were the relatively few cells that actually started off having a strong bias in one direction. So it seems like you can influence them, but only late, so only after they're experiencing doubt, and only if they haven't already made up their minds long ago. So just for fun, then Amalia and George started doing the same experiment on the back to see if once the loser starts retracting, if we can encourage it to become a winner again um, by activating CDC42. And so this is what it looks like. Here's the cell coming along, it splits in half. One of the edges loses, and so she's stimulating, 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 keeps trying, keeps hoping, keeps trying, doesn't give up hope and then eventually is able to actually overcome the decision that's already been made. 
Okay, so uh, so this is pretty dramatic. Um, again, without uh, without the stimulation, uh, the reversal essentially almost never happens. You know, maybe a couple out of 100 cells will change their minds partway through and go back the other way. With the stimulation, she can now get 20% of them to go backwards. Trying to do this early on, again, just like the competition experiment, doesn't work. But interestingly, trying to do it late works, if anything, even better than doing it continuously. So. Basically, what that means is that the, the rear has to retract all the way back down to the cell body before it becomes receptive to the stimulation. There seems to be, again, positive feedback that's driving the rear to maintain itself as a rear. So that was my ding to wrap up. Fortunately, I'm here at the end. So basically, this is our model. Uh, we think initially, uh, the choice between left and right is a truly stochastic decision. The cell is really in a symmetric state. And then as the cell runs into that barrier and things slow down, it begins to experience doubt. So uh, the, the cell can physically no longer move forward, uh, and uh, both sides begin to sort of doubt their commitment to really being the front. And that's the point when we can actually influence and we can drive it one way or the other. Now, after the retraction begins, then we think the system essentially goes into free fall, where the rear um, becomes committed to full retraction and it retracts all the way back to the cell body before it becomes receptive again. But then at the end, um, that part of the cell that's now effectively part of the side of the cell or uh, gets incorporated into the rear um, doesn't care anymore what it is. And you can then uh, drive it to becoming a front after retraction is complete. So um, I showed you a lot of data today. I want to emphasize that uh, basically everything that I showed you was collected by this one graduate student, Amalia Hajithiodoru, who I think is here. Are you here? Maybe not. OK. Um, anyway, uh, I was going to refer questions to her, but I guess I'll take your questions since she's not here. Um, but we also had our uh, wonderful collaborators, George and Sean at University of California, who developed the optogenetic tool in the CDC42 tracker. Felix Lett and Daniel Aremia um, helped design the microfluidic channels and, um, and synthesize them. And then Rob Tibshrani for all the statistical analysis. So I'll stop there and happy to take questions. And if you could raise your hands if you have questions, and a microphone will be passed to you. Um. Hi, Julie. Um, I was wondering if you have any ideas about what's causing the CDC42 to go down when the cell is trying to make this decision at a symmetric leading edge. I can certainly speculate. So for CDC42 activity to be maintained, it has to be delivered and also activated at the leading edge. And surprisingly little is known about the details of how that works at a molecular level in neutrophils. But there's been some really beautiful work done in yeast where a related protein, the original CDC42, is involved in polarization um, prior to bug growth or prior to schmooing. And there, CDC42 is actually transported on actin filaments in a directional sense to get to the front and then stimulates the growth of actin filaments. So there's a positive feedback loop where if you have high CDC42, actin filaments grow in that direction, and then more CDC42 is delivered along the actin filaments, and so it's continuously reinforced. What we think it might be happening here, or at least what I like to believe, is that when the cell gets to the point where it's stuck, where you know, it can no longer move forward because it's trying to wrap around this obstacle and it can't keep moving without ripping itself apart, that um, that positive feedback loop is, is being compromised because the actin polymerization is physically slowing down just because of the constraint of the membrane that's not moving anywhere. And so if, if once the cell gets stuck, the reinforcement of the CDC42 becomes less and less, then eventually, presumably, the normal turnover mechanisms will make the whole thing drop. Uh, and thereby enable the cell to be able to, to change direction. But most of what I said was speculation, except for the work that's been shown in yeast. I was curious, um, the time that it would take for a cell to make a decision under no light stimulation and the light stimulation, was that fairly similar? Or was it a little bit slower when the light was triggered? Because it seemed like in yeah. the images it was a little bit slower. Yeah, so um, so like I said, Amalia and George did this experiment um, you know, more than 100 times with just the lack of stimulation. And on the stimulated ones, I think it was more like 200 times. So there's a wide range in different kinds of responses. The particular movie that I showed you was much slower than average, but they also have other examples where it happens sort of right away um, and it seems to be dispersed over that whole range. In addition to trying to do the statistical, uh, the statistical analysis on the choice to go right and left, Amalia also tried to take similar approaches to figuring out if there's any aspect of cell organization that predicts how long the cell is going to take to make that decision. And again, we really couldn't find anything. So we don't fundamentally understand why there's so much variation in terms of that overall time scale or why some cells respond faster than others. Um, but it's clearly something that's highly variable. And so probably has something to do with intrinsic differences in the cells, but we don't have any good ideas about what that could be.
Sorry, the microphone's coming. Uh, particularly in the zebrafish model with the neutrophila, it looked like some of the leading edges when they split into three were basically hanging on by a thread. Yeah. Do you ever see a, any cases in, in any of those models where instead of it retracting, it just kind of pinches off and, as a bleb or something? Yeah, so we don't, we basically don't see that either in the zebrafish or in the, um, or in the microfluidic channel. Sometimes we can see these really, really long extensions, um, you know, where it really looks like, I mean, almost like a, a, neur a neurite, you know, with a, a little active leading edge and then this long membrane tube that's hooking it back. But, um, but fragmenting is not something these cells are really typically doing. Um, for some of the other immune system cells, like for dendritic cells in particular, uh, Michael Six's group and Matthew Peel's group have done some experiments with a sort of similar approach using microfluidic channels and forcing them to split. And there they actually sometimes do see fragmentation. So I think it's somewhat cell type dependent, but for the neutrophils, they seem like they're really very dedicated to sort of keeping their integrity, you know, to keeping their, their cell body intact. Um, and that again is something that we fundamentally don't understand why that's different among different cell types. Is it possible to rerun the exact same cell 100 times to see if it's more biased right or left? Yeah, no. Uh, so uh, when the cells, the cells come in from you know, one side of the channel, then they go all the way through to the chemo tract on the other side. Once they come out the other side, we can't find them again. But we do have in the channel, we have, um, I can't remember how many, but I think it's something like four or five um, of these obstacles. And uh, so there are two things that we can observe, not at the level of 100 times, but just at the level of four or five. One is um, if a cell goes right or left at one obstacle, what's its likelihood of going right or left at the next obstacle? It seems to be completely independent, 50-50. And the other is we were a little concerned early on that you know, maybe there's some asymmetries within our channels that we're not aware of. You know, by design, they should be symmetric, but that doesn't mean we got it perfect. But we can have the same obstacle and see one cell go up and make a choice, and then see another cell go up and make a choice. And again, it seems to be 50-50. So at the level of the individual cell, um, it really seems uh, completely random, at least as best as we can tell. All right, unfortunately, that's all the time we'll have for questions right now. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Julie. Our second speaker.